My name is yeah. Dave. This here is Steve Edwards, and we are going to be talking about mules and donkeys this Wednesday, just like we do every single week. Steve, how was your Fourth of July weekend? It was uh, just like any other weekend, really. We just kind of only thing we need is right here at the ranch, so we just kind of hung out here, you know, and uh, went to church on Sunday, and we even went to a movie. Now that I think about it, yeah, boy, and then. Uh, and today is my 51st anniversary. Happy anniversary. That's awesome. Yeah, 51 years, you know. Yeah, boy. What's the so, secret? The secret. There's only one secret that glues you together, and that is the Savior named Jesus. That's right. That's the only right. way. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, hey, happy anniversary. I'm so glad that you uh, that you decided to still take a few minutes. Of course, we would have understood if uh, – if you had to uh, say, hey, you know what, I'm going to sit this one out. But you're here, I'm here, the folks are here, so we're going to get into it. However, before we get going, I'm going to take a look at who's hanging out with us. Before we get going, um, there's just three things that I want to say. Number one is, uh, well, A, bef before number one, we're so glad that you're here hanging out with us. And uh, we just love coming and hanging out every single week talking about mules and donkeys. The first thing that I want to say is and just make sure that you let us know that you are here. So on Facebook and on YouTube, there is a comment section. In those comments, go ahead, just say your name, where you're watching from, uh, and uh, where you were for 4th of July. And if you're at home, that's awesome. We like hearing that too. Uh, so just let us know that you're here. Let us know that we're not alone. Uh, see that there are other people hanging out with us and uh, we'll make this mule and donkey community get smaller as it gets bigger. The second thing is that we ask that you ask any and every question. You may think, oh man, they talked about this. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to ask the same question again or hey, you know, I I'll just sit back and see if anybody asks my question. You know what? Nonsense. We want to know exactly what's going on in your world and exactly what yeah. you're working on. And hey, if you just want to celebrate something that's going well with you, uh, and you and your mule, put that in there. If you got a question, we want you to ask it. Your question is a good question and we're ready for it. Uh, and there's really no question that's off limits. And then the last thing is that you share the broadcast. Just go ahead, share it out with friends and family. If you're on Facebook, tag friends and family who you think would be uh, enjoy what we're doing. And if you're on YouTube, grab that link and send it over to folks who, uh, who you know would love to hang out. So Steve, I say we ought to get to welcoming folks. What do you say? That's, that looks good to me. All right, so here we go. Let's see who we've got watch. Oop, I gotta refresh. Gotta refresh my screen here over on uh, over on YouTube. Uh, you know what? I'm trying to get that going right there. But let's do this first. Tell me a little bit how things are going with those sheep, because I know that you got some sheep for just to go out there and round up. Go ahead and yeah. tell us a little bit about that. I've got to bring something up on my screen here. Go ahead, you bet. Well, J uh, Jess, he's a two-year-old border collie pup. And uh, we've been working cattle with him pretty consistently. But <coughs> the cattle are two and a half hours away down at the Andrada Ranch. So up here, uh, he needed something to do. So I got him seven uh, Barbado cross sheep. And they are just about as wild as jackrabbit. They're starting to gentle down now. I've got one that, that uh, we may call barbecue. We'll see what happens. But... Anyway, we uh, Jess has been working these sheep. He's been doing a good job uh, trying to figure out these sheep. It ain't like the cattle. Uh, these sheep will, the, you know, the cattle do try you and they do challenge you, but they'll move on. These sheep will turn around and try to uh, try to uh, <laughs> hit you with their horns, you know. So I've got to I've got to do some other things with these. Uh, with these sheep, it won't be so bad. I mean, the cows do too. They'll they'll chase Jess around the other dogs too. But but uh, Jess finally got them cows figured out. And we'll turn and get a hold of them on the nose and do good. But anyway, here, we we work them two three times a day. You know, thirty minutes at a time. That's awesome. Slow and steady, steady as she goes. All right, so yep. I got everything up here that I needed. Want to say hi to Tammy. Tammy's here watching today. Want to say hi to Kevin and Jan from Chino Valley. Kevin's from Glen Rose, Texas. Uh, we got Muhammad from, uh, he says it's 1230 a.m., but I want to stay up and learn. Thanks, gentlemen. We're so glad that you're here, Muhammad. We've got Eileen saying happy anniversary, Susan and Steve. Isn't that super sweet? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Got, and then uh, and Muhammad, he's from South Africa, isn't he? I think so. 
I think yes. so. Muhammad, tell it, just remind us real quick again where you're watching from. I Lee, uh, Nadine, watching from New Hampshire. Jan says, happy anniversary. Uh, Tammy says, watching from New Walla, Oklahoma. David and Di from Down Under in Australia. Yes, Our Australian friends just chimed in. How yep. it go, how's it going, guys? Good to see oh, you. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Marty from uh, De Debecu, Colorado. Did I say that right? Debbie Q? Uh, uh, that's a new one on me. Hey, yeah. we're learning things, Steve. We're yeah, learning boy. new things. Just got a mule. Thanks for all the videos. And my question is sensitive ears. He hates them being messed with. Can I get, can't get a bridle on. We will answer that question here. Uh, let's see. Yep. We've got Meg from Chino Valley, Arizona. We've got Karen. We got all the folks here. Let me look over on YouTube. We've got Nat watching Steve's granddaughter. There's my granddaughter. We've got yep. Kelly. We've got Kenny. We've got D. We've got Randy and Gary and Barbara and Kathy. All the gangs here. So uh -huh. let's get right into it. This question was emailed into us by Mary. Mary asks, uh, I have a 17 year old Molly mule. She throws her head and makes it impossible for me to bridle her, bridle her or put on a fly mask. My husband has to pinch her nose and hold her ear, ear while I put it on a bridle. I've yeah. tried taking the bridle apart. Nothing works. <clears throat> she has had her teeth floated two years ago. This is the second year she started doing this, and it seems to be getting worse. Any suggestions, any videos I, I should be watching? Steve? Well, you know, ear shy is really tough. We got uh, a little video there on a mule that's ear shy and how that usually starts is we put the bridle on and as we put it on we pull the ear over and we pull the ear over which is fine uh, but the big problem is most people don't have a brow band for the ears of a mule and so it's kind of pinching on the ears your brow band should be 19 inches on the average and that's the part that comes right in front of the ears now Here's the next part. When we pull the ears to put them in there, which is fine. I, I do it all the time. They always want to put the bridle on loose. So take the, the bridle, loosen it up two notches, let it hang down. Put the bridle in, or put your ears in, and then let the mule pick the bit up and carry it and adjust it to that spot. Here's what happens. We tend to put the bridle on the same every single day. Well, we don't mean to, but we bump the bars of the mouth, we bump the teeth, and we make it uncomfortable. Well, now to keep you and to keep me from uh, pulling uh, up on their mouth and to put the ear in, we throw our head. And now they become ear shy and they can now use that against you. So always, folks, when you take a bridle off, drop it down two or three notches, make sure the mule's head is down, tip the nose to the left, slide the bridle off to the right ear and then the left ear. And then that way you see when that bridle is loosened up, they, they, what in the world was that? Sorry there? about that. I'm trying to get the video to send up and I didn't click pause fast enough. It's okay. Go ahead, Steve. Sorry about that. Musicians around here. <laughs> so, so what we want to do, folks, anytime we're putting on a halter, anytime we're putting on the bridle, head down, nose to the left. That's number one. That way they are physically and mentally ready to get, take the halter, ready to take the bridle. Now, the next part is we slide the bridle on nice and easy, but remember that bridle has to be loose. So loosen it up two to three notches, put the right ear in first, left ear in second, then adjust the bridle. So number one, a 19, make sure you got a 19 inch brow band. That's number one. Number two, Always loosen the bridle up when you take it off and then leave it loose when you put it on so that the mule will reach down, pick up them and pack the bit. And now let's go back to the ear side problem. Your husband is basically right by, by pinching the nose. Uh, there's nothing wrong with earing them down. I've eared down a lot of mules over the years and that's fine. That doesn't make him ear shy. Uh, but the nose is the key thing. So pinching the nose uh, is is one of the things, but what I like to do is train all of my mules to my humane twitch. Uh, I've got that video uh, called Doctor and Your Meal Sometimes, and basically what it shows is you take the twitch and you open and close it, open and close it, create natural endorphins, get the old head nice and relaxed, 
slide the bit in around the around the the uh, the twitch, and if the mule moves, open and close it, open and close it. So in other words, you're making it more of a comfortable situation than an uncomfortable situation. And the other way too is to take your middle finger, and I always get a kick out of this. See the people's eyes. But I use this finger right here to rub the bars of the mouth to make the animal say, "Oh boy, that feels good." Give me some more. Remember, we got we did a video of that, didn't we? Yeah. Dave? Yeah. And you can see him dropping her head, dropping her head, and I'm rubbing the bars of the mouth. So you see, it's an uncomfortable situation, but you make it comfortable. So do that, and then pretty soon start rubbing on the eyes, rubbing between on the ears, and this sort of thing, and it'll eventually get better. But for for a while, folks, uh, you're going to have to use that twitch all the time. Don't use the twitch to where you put the rope on and the handle and twitch it down and make the nose uh, make them really uncomfortable. Don't do that. You want to create natural endorphins, and you can do that uh, by using that uh, humane twitch. So we've had a lot of new folks who have joined us uh, here in the last month, last two months. And I said this last week on our broadcast, and I'll say it again. I just put a link in the uh, comment section to the twitch and the doctor in your mule video. And, and here's the thing that you need to know. When you look at the humane twitch. I was there when Steve was recording it. It looked bizarre to me and it looked like, golly, what's happening to this mule right here? And yeah. what you see in the video, what you will, like with your own eyes, what you'll see is a mule that is uncomfortable, doesn't want his eye messed with, doesn't want the medication to be applied. And that mule going from don't mess with me all the way to Steve being able to put the ointment in there with no problems within a time span of probably six minutes. It's amazing the yes. level of ease that he was able to achieve in applying that ointment using the humane twitch and rubbing on the nose and doing exactly what he's talking about. So I put that in the comment section. Y'all can go check it out. See for yourselves. It's an amazing tool. It's an amazing approach uh, to taking what Steve just said is an uncomfortable situation and making it comfortable there. So very good. Uh, next now, question. I, oh, you know, Dave, I might mention, I, not only do I train all of my meals to do that, you know, but everybody's meals that were brought into me for training over the years, I taught how to be twitch trained. You can do more doctoring using the mules nose, the come along rope and that humane twitch. I've castrated, I have stitched up. It's folks, it's a it's a needs to be a good part of your foundational training for your meals and your donkeys. Very good. So uh, welcome to everybody who's just joining us. I know we had a couple more people hop on. So my name's Dave. This is Steve. Go ahead, put your questions in the comment section, either on YouTube or Facebook. We'll get to them. Uh, the question that came in on Facebook, this was from Tammy. She was first one to comment. She says, my little donkey's legs are a mess. I think it's mud fever and the flies are chewing her up too. Do you have any suggestions for how to treat her? Yeah, and, and you know what? Uh, we talked about this. Uh, uh, Espana, uh, Espana, um, I've, I've got a bottle of it right here, uh, and it works really good. Here's the problem is they, especially donkeys, and the mules get it from the donkey, is they're allergic to the fly bites. And so what happens is the flies will go to biting on them and pretty soon it's bloody up and down their legs, all around their chest. It can be horrible all along their bellies. So I used to tell everybody I use WD-40 and I, and I still do that every once in a while. But this new, pro, this new product, uh, I met this lady in Minnesota, what, three years ago. Yeah. And it's, it's a Spania. Silk? Mm hmm Silk. Is it, is it the silk? Espanya I just silk. put a link to all the Espana products in the comment section yeah. so folks can check it out. Yeah, we, yeah, we really, that's really a good product. And But here's the thing is, you got to get it before. See, now that you're, now that's already chewed up and now that you got all the, the blood and, and the blood clotting and all this sort of thing, it's kind of, it's kind of too late, but you can still use that Espana product and it still helps out a lot. She's, Give her a call. She's really good about answering questions. Tell her I sent you. But uh, but you need to do that before fly season start because them poor little donkeys and mules, they eat up bad. Yeah. Yeah, we don't want that. Uh, so let's see here. I uh, wanted to go back through. Um, had another question come in on Facebook. This one's from Tammy. 
uh, says, can a bad past with your mule, i.e. abuse, can that determine how they will perform and react in the future? No, Tammy, I, I, you know, I used to be extremely uh, abusive when it come down to these mules. I would throw them on the ground, tarp them. Uh, I would wad them all up and this sort of thing. Uh, but, you know, no, it doesn't it doesn't create problems. Uh, will they kind of not trust you a little bit? Yeah, just for a short time. But then away you go. I've had people say all the time that, you know, the mule had been eared down. That was the reason you couldn't touch his ears. Well, I eared down a lot of mules over the years just because, say, for instance, we were out in the desert. And we got choya cactus. We would ear them down to, to be able to pull the cactus out. Uh, we did that years ago. Uh, I, let me just give you an example. Let's look at natural horsemanship. We take the lead mare, and you all have heard me say this, the lead mare. She asks, she tells, and she demands. So she pins her ears, and she says, don't come no closer. And But the new mule keeps on coming in. Then she pins her ears. She asks by, by pinning her ears, and then she tails by switching her tail and pinning her ears. And the mule still keeps on coming. The new donkey keeps on coming in, wants to visit. And then finally she spins and kicks and demands. Okay. Sometimes I've seen some of these mules get whipped on really bad. I mean, bit, kicked, everything else. But guess what? That mule will fall in love with that herd mare and follow her anywhere she wants to go. So she's been beat. She's been kicked on. Uh, folks, if you use the thought of ask, tell, demand, you're going to get a lot done. Uh, I have taken in uh, lots of mules with bad past. Uh, my last one is right now in Kauai, Hawaii, with one of my apprentices. And it was he was 12 years old when he was given to me. Uh, was a beautiful mule foxtrotter. As out of his mother was a world champion foxtrotter. They had used a poor saddle on him, uh, and it had rubbed his back really bad. He didn't want to be caught. Uh, several things. It took me oh probably about two years to where I had total trust in the way we went. You know, uh, so it, it, can you fix it? Yes, but the thing is, don't do the same thing. Is what people have done. I think abuse is putting on a nylon halter. Uh, I think abuse is putting on a bridle that's supposed to fit a horse and and fits a mule, and you put it on a mule. I think abuse is when you decide, okay, I'm not going to spend the money uh, to buy the equipment to make the animal comfortable, uh, but yet a lot of people think that, David, they think that beating on them uh, is is uh, is the worst thing. It's not because it's that uncomfortable thing, you know, just like the the throwing of the head, not touching the ears. And but a lot of people don't know no better. They don't know it has to have an 18 inch brow band. But I have I have helped a lot of mules over the years, Dave. That's supposed to be quote abused, but uh, some of them, a matter of fact, some of them were supposed to be that the guy said a guy could not train on this mule couldn't be around him yeah. and I was around him within hours you know yeah absolutely hopefully that helps there uh, so Marty had a question uh, Marty was asking about the uh, the ear shy mule as well he said um, sensitive ears hates them being messed with is would that's the same answer that you gave a little bit earlier right yeah yeah and and that the video that we have the ear shy mule uh, shows one of my apprentices working with a severe ear shy mule and uh, and and in result, was able to get the bridle on and this sort of thing. Um, and I think I've got a couple others too, don't I? I forget. I've done yeah, some we've got videos. a few videos on uh, a few videos on uh, YouTube that I'm putting a link to, and then I'll put a link to the instructional video as well. Yeah, the big thing is, folks, loosen those bridle ups up, up when you take them off, and don't create one wrinkle or two wrinkles. That you know that really. It makes them uncomfortable. They're trying to do the best they can. And then what people do is they put a cavison around their mouth to keep it shut. And so they have to do it. That could be just as much abuse too, y'all. My computer's acting funny here for a second, Steve. Ah, um, it's a computer. Yep, there we go. Okay. 
Um, so the next question that we've got here, this one is, uh, oh, I want to say hi to all of our YouTube people. Ke uh, Kelly says, hi from Oregon. Just got my very first donkey, a BLM burrow. Steve, what's a BLM burrow? Bureau of Land Management. Uh, what they do is they've been running free for years. Uh, it's just kind of like the, the wild horses. Uh, they've been running free for years. Notice I didn't say Mustang. They're not truly Mustangs, folks. There's only one true Mustang, and that's the Geiger Mustang, and that's on an island on its own. All these other horses were just ones that folks had turned loose, especially if you live close to the reservation, and then they become uh, wild. And you know, we've had them over here at Red Mountain for years over by the river. Uh, and then all of a sudden, somebody come in and said, oh, wild horses, we gotta save them, uh, even though they were doing a lot of destruction. But going back to the BLM, uh, over here at uh, at the uh, Florence uh, prison, the uh, federal prison, they have a program over there where they train them uh, donkeys and they sell them and horses as well. You can buy a horse trained, ready to go for 800 bucks over here. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Very good. Um, so we've got uh, so we've got um, Kelly. Uh, Kenny says shot uh, shotgun. Kenny Yates tuning in to my favorite show. I never thought that I would be associated with something on TV, something on the internet that says my favorite show. So Kenny, appreciate that. How about that? Yeah. Let's see. Uh, uh, Gary says it's toasty in Tula Rosa. I think I'll stay inside and listen to Steve. I like that. Uh, Barbara go. says, hi, Steve. I'm enjoying using your tack with my new mule. What advice do you have for my hubby who is a beginner rider and needs to establish leadership in the saddle with his mule? Mm. Okay. Leadership in the saddle and that. That changes things. You first want to make sure you have leadership on the ground. Uh, and, and what the leadership, one of the reasons I say leadership on the ground, not only does it help you establish leadership, but it helps your timing, timing. Because with most folks, Dave, it's already too late. They're already going to the right, and the guy wanted to go to the left, but the mule's already going to the right. So the timing wasn't there to get it. So the best advice I can tell you to do is first do it on the ground, get the feel with the lead rope, because as you use the lead rope, it's going to be the same thing as using your hands uh, when it comes down to, to writing, you know, uh, and, and you all know how much I like to use my come on rope and this sort of thing. So let's go back to the saddle. Folks, the best thing I can tell you to do in the saddle is so that Mr. Mule and Mr. Donkey understands that is not acceptable. And what this is, remember, they, they have two brains, one in the right and one on the left. They have a brain about the size of a walnut that disseminates all the information that you have given to them that's not natural to them, okay? In other words, it's your communication. So if, you, if they're doing something you don't wanna do, you ask right, left, right, left that says right brain listen to me, left brain listen to me. And if they're not paying attention, then you tell them right brain listen to me, left brain listen to me. And if they still don't listen to you, right, left, right, left, right, left, really fast until you get what you want. Ask, tell, demand. It's extremely important, folks. Well, I'm gonna hurt Fluffy's mouth. Well, do you wanna go end up in ER or, or do you want Fluffy to get his mouth? Well, eventually, no problem at all, we'll, we'll get healed and be just fine. I prefer not to go to the ER. It does not create enough problems. Folks, I have seen more mules' tongues cut from a smooth snap a bit from people pulling on them than the going the right, left, right, left. Do what's natural to the animal, and that is to, to make them uncomfortable when you're uncomfortable. So husband, that's what he needs to do, any of you. Works, doesn't it, Dave? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it works. I put a link to uh, Establishing Leaderships. We've got a whole series of videos uh, on establishing leadership on the ground. Uh, nothing nothing about those is in the saddle, but it is exactly what Steve is sa saying, getting that leadership on the ground so you can have leadership in the saddle. And the right, left, right, left, I mean, it really works. Um, I've ridden a mule two times. So for those of you who thought that I'm a mule guy, I'm just a good friend of Steve Edwards, and I like hanging out with them, okay? Okay. 
But when it comes to the mule, I've ridden twice, one on Steve's ranch, one down in the Andrada ranch in Tucson. And when I got on this mule, when I got on the first mule, it was Stacy. Stacy knew to just follow Steve. And what mule were you riding? Do you remember which mule you were riding that day? I don't. It's been uh, so long. Yeah. It's been so long. So Steve really was riding fun. and Stacy pretty much just followed. She'd ridden that trail so many times. She knew exactly yep. what to do. We came to a little quarry where there was no water down there, but it was kind of steep. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit frightened, right? I don't want to fall off. And so I said, what am I supposed to do? He goes, Steve, he goes, Dave, just let go of the reins and she knows what to do. And sure enough, anybody who's ridden a mule, you see the mule do this. They take a step forward, they look and they position their foot and then they take another and they, they're figuring it out as they go. Horses just go. It can be real dangerous. But a mule actually is intentional about where she places her feet. So she went down. That was the first time. Second time, there was nobody leading. Now, it was, you know, just kind of on the ranch there in real small quarters, but nobody was leading. I was up on there, and the mule did not want to ride. He didn't want to do it. He wanted to go. Was was it Jasper? Is that the one that I was riding? Or which one was I riding? Do you remember? Uh, uh, well, well, it was that big bay. Yeah. Uh, I think his name was Luke. Yeah. I was yeah. riding, and he just wanted to keep going back to the hitching rail. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted yeah. to be done. And yeah. I was like, well, what am I, what am I supposed to do, Steve? And he goes, you got to tell him where to go. And so he would start going. And so, you know, I'd kind of put pressure and he'd start going back there. Well, then he'd start going and I'd be like, I'm getting close. Like, how do I stop? I don't want to run into the tree. He goes right, left, right, left. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. That's what I've been hearing for the last 10 years. So sure enough, right, left, right, left, boom, stop right there. Yep. Yep. It, it works. works. It works. Yep. It just flat out works. All right. So let's keep moving along here. Uh, we've got D questions saying, hey, Steve, I sent you a couple of pictures on your phone showing you dry spots after my ride today. I think she got some fat pads over the winter and uh, that is where the dry spots are. Do you have any advice? So what are we talking about here, Steve? And then answer the question there if you can with the advice. Yeah, the, the definitely dry spots. And Dave, where your dry spots always are, horses, mules, and donkeys, the biggest place they are there, they can be throughout the saddle. Yeah. The biggest place they are is right in behind the scapula. So here's the scapula and here's this flat place. And then there's a fat pocket. You can see it in this video, in this picture, Dave, you can see literally the circle of the fat pocket right where it sets on. The biggest thing you can do, the best thing you can do folks all the time is don't tighten that front cinch up real tight. Okay. Now, if you're using a wool pad, it's going to suck more moisture away. It, read that. Read the ads. It says it whisks the moisture away. You don't want to take the moisture away. You want it to be as wet as possible, you know. And when they have those fat pockets, now here's the downside. You all know, and I know, because the older we get, the fatter we get, and our fat pockets flat start sticking out, you know. Is that, and, what's, is uh, that what's happening? Is that what's happening to me? I'm getting older? That's right. You one day you woke up and your chest fell to your drawers. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. So so that fat pockets will tend to get bigger if you are feeding a lot of carbohydrates or if uh, or if you're over tightening that sense too. If you feed a lot of carbohydrates, uh, that fat pocket will go, or if you're overfeeding your mule. A lot of people think they're they're being really nice to them by giving them a little bit more. No, no, folks, that's just as much as abuse as it is beating on them. Overfeeding a mule, all that weight on that little tiny hoof that's supposed to be uh, on a donkey. Very good. Uh, so uh, we've got Muhammad chiming back in. Muhammad says he's from Qatar, and that's right. As soon as I saw that, I was like, that's right. I yeah. should have remembered that. He's our only yeah. viewer from Qatar. Muhammad, we are so glad you're here. Thank you for staying up late and hanging out with us. Uh, yeah. Diane oh. says uh, hello from Wooster, Ohio. Uh, Haley's watching. Hey, Steve and Dave, it is pouring rain here in Virginia. We would also like to wish a happy anniversary to Steve and his wife. That's real sweet. Thank Appreciate you. That. Thank you. It's fantastic. Uh, Donna's watching from Oklahoma. William's watching from Virginia. Uh, Richard's watching from Palestine, Texas. It is real hot in East Texas. The sheep make good heroes. Gyros, heroes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What does that yeah. mean? Well, it's a sandwich. Oh, oh, Gyro. oh. <laughs> I thought I thought they did something to me. He's talking about the meat. Yes. Yeah, boy. Oh my goodness. Yeah, we could call this sheep gyro. 
You yeah, know, I, could, I, I may name him Gyro because this sucker, <laughs> it wants to be a jackrabbit. It's amazing. Oh my goodness. That's good. Okay. So let's hop back over on YouTube here, folks. If you've got any questions, go ahead and put them in the comment section. Uh, Barbara says happy anniversary. She's watching from Castle Rock, Colorado. Uh, Thanks, Barbara. Kathy says, Steve, a girl I know has a two month John baby and he wants to bite and kick all the time. What can be done about this two month old John baby? Uh, he's going to be biting and kicking. That's just kind of what they do. So what can be done about them? This is one of my favorite things, folks. And Dave, you probably haven't heard me talk about this one. Get you a water pistol and put water in it. And when he comes at you biting and kicking, squirt him with a water gun. Yes, sir. It works good. Give it a try, folks. I think that's a solution my uh, my little boys would love to put into play right there. They're all about the water guns right now out by the pool. It's hot. Yeah, yeah, there you go. You betcha. Real hot. Oh, that's, that's what I would do with a young baby like that because he just thinks, you know, he just thinks, oh, boy, looky here, another another mule, another donkey. You know, that's he don't realize it, so you have to do that. But here's here's the thing, folks. Just as soon as those testicles drop, you give him – brain surgery that is important just as soon as they drop get them done those john mules the quicker you castrate them the the better a meal you're going to have yeah that's good uh steve real quick i forgot to tell you something at the beginning of the uh at the beginning of the show i was in uh i spent um the fifth through the seventh in california i was in, in la and mm, uh friday yeah. night me and my brother-in-law we drove to california and uh, we got there, uh, picked up our buddy, and we drove to the Dodgers game. We were watching the Dodgers uh, that Friday night. They were going to do Fourth of July fireworks. It was going to be fantastic. Oh. We're there. Do you remember what happened Friday night? Oh, you have a rumble. I was sitting in Dodger Stadium watching the game, and all of a sudden, it felt like people were jumping up and down on the uh, upper concourse. Wow. They weren't. It was the earthquake. Earthquake. It was seriously... Ah. It, it felt like this for about 30 seconds, just kind of like moving back and forth. Wow. It was the scariest thing. I think it's the scariest, the scare, the most scared I've ever been in my entire life. Because we're really? sitting right up underneath the third deck. So there's the lower bowl that extends out to the field. Then there's the second deck, which is where we were, third deck and fourth deck. So we were, you know, we were the burger in that, we were the meat in that burger right there. Ooh. And it was super, super scary. Rest of the weather was fantastic the entire the entire trip. Nice yeah. to get out of the heat. But Steve, that was that was the scariest I think I've ever that scariest I've ever think I've been uh, wow. in my life because I didn't know what was going to happen. That was it was scary. Wow. Yep. I bet it was. Yeah, about the time you said that, I remembered about that thing. Wow. Yeah. 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 Felt it all the way. I got back from California. Was uh, it was real late Sunday night. Dropped off my brother-in-law, uh, drove back to the house, parked the car, pardon me, parked the car, walked up to the front uh, front of the house. As I was walking, one of the slabs in our front yard actually tipped in like this, all the way from where it happened in California, moved wow. all the way out. Folk, friends in, uh, friends were telling me in, in uh, outside of Phoenix that they felt it too, that water came out of their pool. That was a massive earthquake. We avoided a big one right there. From all yeah. I heard, everyone was safe and no one, no one got hurt. But that yeah. was that was pretty scary. Yeah. All right. So next question we got here. This one comes from Tiny, and Tiny sent an email in saying, "I want to know if soy pellets are good for the mule." Now I don't think we've ever talked about soy pellets. We've talked about pellets. Are the soy pellets good for the mule? You know, I can't tell you. I've never fed soy pellets at all, so I really wouldn't know where to begin with that, partner. So, um, so talk to me a little bit. There might be some folks who who really haven't heard us talk about pellets in particular, um, and why pellets make such a great feed over, say, uh, hay or being left out to pasture and having uh, access to all that free feed. What is it that you like? about the pellet what is it that makes that a favorite feed for you well the number one thing i like about it it's the best for the digestive system on the mule and donkey uh, in in the pellet it has everything that mule and donkey needs everything 
all the vitamins and minerals and and the uh, uh, the the forage is there. And it may be as big as your thumb to start with, but when it gets wet, it's three times as big. So it actually blows up in the belly and they feel like they're they're full. So here's the thing, folks. The other thing is, is the how clean the feed, feed is. Hay is not very clean. It's uh, you get all that rack poop in there and snake parts and stuff. And it's it's not that clean to feed. They can get by. But there's so many animals that people think are, have colic and it's not colic. You know, uh, it's almost like botulism from all the nastiness that, that's in that hay. And believe me, I fed hay for years, you know, uh, but I didn't realize uh, how much how much healthier my mules were and my donkeys were when I started feeding uh, a nice clean hay pellet. Um, so one of the things that one of the things that comes up is uh, is folks will say, "Hey, uh, I know you recommend Lake and Millings, Lake and Light. Um, I know you recommend Star Milling uh, and their feed. I can't get those where I'm at." And I've heard you mention that folks can look at the ingredients and make their own feed, um, but I've never really followed up about that. Is that something that's difficult? Is that something that folks just know how to do? Is it something that is worth learning to do to make your own feed. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Because it's always been intriguing to me when you've said that. You say, hey, folks, if you can't get it out there, go ahead and look at the nutritional facts and you can go ahead and create your own. Yeah, and, and you can create it. Uh, and it's and, But the, the least expensive way in the long run is to just go down and take the ingredients that, that I've got on that article, Mules Can't Stand Prosperity, Take it down to your feed store and say, hey, uh, I want to know what feed you have the closest to this. Now, let me add to this, folks. The feed that we put together, uh, Lake and Light here in Arizona, was what the mules needed in this southern part of the United States, the southern part of it. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, and even that you can even buy it in like New Mexico and some parts of Texas, but just take the ingredients down and, and get your, your, your pellets that way. Uh, you may have to use it as a supplement, uh, but even look at it. So, but the big thing you can do is if you, if you have a veterinarian, it's a pretty good nutritionist, let him run some hair samples on your mules and donkeys and see what they are short of, and then go from there. Uh, the biggest thing that, that the hay is, is lacking on is selenium, and selenium helps with the digestive system on the mule and donkey. So that between that and zinc. That's good. So something else that I've had a question for, and real quick, uh, for folks who are just joining us, who are new, who are coming in a little bit here down uh, just past the three o'clock marker. My name's Dave. This is Steve. We're really glad that you're hanging out with us. Every Wednesday, we get together with you on Facebook and YouTube to just answer as many questions as we can about mules and donkeys. We really have been just absolutely blown away by the reports that we're getting from folks um, who have really found these talks super helpful. We've got folks who are out doing work right now, and they're not commenting because they got the earbuds in and they're listening while they're out on the ranch while they're at yeah. their job, while they're listening, yeah. while driving in the car. Uh, so we got a lot of folks who are tuning in every single week, and it's just awesome to hear how the clinics that we're doing right here online are having an impact. So we're glad that you're here, and we would love to know what questions you got, want to know what you're working on, and if there's anything that we can help with. That's really what these are all about. It's, uh, it's, it's an open Q&A uh, to make sure that you get the help you need for this week so that you can come back next week and give a report and come with new questions that you got. So go ahead, uh, let us know that you're watching, put your name in the comment section, uh, ask your question, that's the second thing we ask. First is that you share your name, the second is that you ask your question, and the third thing is that you just think about sharing our broadcast with folks who you know would find it most helpful. That's really what we wanna do, we wanna help you out uh, and make sure you get the most out of that relationship with that animal. So the question that I was gonna follow up with, Steve, talking about feed, um, when we were at the Andrada Ranch, uh, I believe it was uh, Monday night, we were getting ready to go, and there were these white blocks out in the pasture. Mm -hmm. And all the mules and the horses 
they were off eating their feed. They all had their feed separate, right? So as not to you know, fight with one another. Mm -hmm. um, but then there were these white blocks positioned throughout. What were those white blocks? Is that something that should be done? Is that something that's only for particular diets? Is there a better way to do that? Can you share a little bit with me about what I was seeing there uh, in regards yep. to feed? You bet, uh, Dave. Those were 50-pound blocks of salt, just good old iodized salt. And they're in a pyramid shape so that the uh, water, when it, when it rains and this sort of thing, will go off the block really quick and you don't lose a lot. But <clears throat> with, with your dietary needs on your mules and donkeys, you've got to have salt. And what I would do is uh, to encourage them to, to eat the salt is I would take uh, rock salt and put it across my pellets. And they would work their way around and eating that rock salt. Some mules and donkeys uh, decide they don't like that that 50 pound block of salt. And by the way, folks, don't waste your money on an iodized salt block. That that uh, I mean, not iodized uh, uh, the mineral block. Don't waste your money on that. You can buy some good quality vitamins and minerals at the store to give to your mules and your donkeys. Uh, but there again, don't give them vitamins and minerals until you first talk to your vet and see what they know. Very good. Appreciate you answering that for me. Uh, next question we got. Uh, this one comes from uh, Bobby. Bobby's a new uh, new to the show, and uh, he left a question on one of our other YouTube videos. Says, "What is the proper length of the front cinch?" Now I've got a video on this that I'll put a link to, but you want to talk a little bit about the proper <laughs> length that folks need to be looking at for their front cinch? Well, your, your front cinch isn't the important one. The back cinch is the most important one. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's not scientific. It's not, uh, it doesn't need to be the perfect figure. It can be shorter, it could be longer. Here's what you want. Your upper D-ring and your lower D-rings. Is your upper D-rings on your saddle your D-ring on your cinch. Now, you want to have enough room between those D-rings so that as you're going riding throughout the day, you can tighten them up without having D-ring to D-ring being close together. And so, you know, my average thing is to have them roughly about 16 inches, uh, 12 to 16 inches from the bottom of the D-ring on the saddle to the top of the D-ring on the cinch. So, as an example, if you have a 14, 14, two mule. And uh, so on the front, you'd probably put a 28 inch cinch to a 38 inch cinch, I mean to a 30 inch cinch. And then on the back, especially with my saddles, because the D-ring is up higher on my saddles than, than the front one is. So uh, in, in the back, then I'd probably put 34 to a 36 inch cinch. Now, one little mule that I ride down to Andrada, <laughs> a little fat bugger carries almost a 40 inch cinch, but he is an easy keeper and he is, he is fat. <laughs> Very good. Uh, so I got another question here. This one's from uh, Marie and she's new to the program as well. She commented on last week's uh, broadcast. She says, uh, hi, Steve, Robert and Marie here from Fort Dick, California. Our question is when you're in back country and you're riding your mule, and your mule gets bit on the nose um, uh, or by a rattlesnake, what should you try and do? Oh, man. And I tell you what, it can happen so easy. Tell you what I like to do, folks, is I carry two, the, the, uh, the two syringes, those big syringes. They're roughly around, uh, around uh, three quarters of an inch apiece. And I cut the one end off of it so that, it, so that you don't have to put a needle on it. And I use Vaseline on it, and I shove one in each side. And by doing that, you'll, you'll be able to help the, the mule and the donkeys so that they can still breathe. Because the problem is when they get bit on the nose, it, it, it contracts, and then they end up, you know, it's not good. They can end up dying from it, you know. But, or you can take a water hose, a uh, three-quarter inch water hose, and uh, you can cut you some links about uh, eight inches or so and shove it up in there, put some Vaseline 
uh, with a little bit of uh, lube of some kind and shove it up in there. That's the best thing you can do. And the other thing, folks, is uh, they do have anti-venom. Matter of fact, I've done it with my dog, Jess. Yep. I give him an anti-venom shot uh, just because we're out in the desert and we're always around these things. <clears throat> so I give him an anti-venom shot. And then if he does get bit, I give him a backup shot. But on top of that, Dave, I uh, I, I, I keep uh, uh, a, a needle and I keep a line and I run a line with, uh, with water. I run a line like you do for hydration, hydrating people uh, in, a, in a vein, but with the dogs and mules, I run, uh, I run a line, uh, it's called sub Q, so underneath the skin. And, and they, they look funny uh, with all that water in them, but sub Q in them with the, the biggest thing with the snake bites is the dehydration. That's the big thing. Yeah, very good. So, so I do run a line and I do, I do uh, give, them, give them moisture that way. Very good. Uh, next question. Kenny just sent this in. Uh, Kenny says, Steve, could you talk about your uh, Bozal and Hackamore experience? And and is it uh, good to ever start mules with them? Sounds as if you've worked with them. Can you share about Hackamores? Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, in my office right here, I've got the last Hackamore that Nick West made. And Nick was out of Canada. And I learned a lot about Hackamores with him. And, uh, and, and the, especially the fine art of it. I, I do use Hackamore's Bozell's with my mules, but I, uh, I, there's going to, it's going to be one out of a hundred. That's going to be good enough to use the Bozell consistently. The problem is you see mules are very sensitive about their nose. So I always start with a, a well-adjusted halter, do good groundwork. And then I go from there with my my mule rider's martingale, and then I go from there with my trail rider bit. Now, if I have one that's exceptional, that really rolls off his hocks and is fluent and is soft, doesn't stiffen his neck, I'll go ahead and use a hackamore to really put a fine run on him. But it it takes a a, a rare good mule to start him with a hackamore from the beginning to end. Usually it's way too much on their nose because they're very sensitive about their nose. So if you use a hackamore constantly, you can end up, they'll brace their neck and you can have a runaway. So I got a question about the nose. Now, there's a lot of horse people out there who look at the mule and mm -hmm. just look at the animal as a whole and say, hey, it's equine. And so one of the things that I, now I don't know if this is the truth or not, but my perception is that halters on a horse are to be up much higher. That a halter on a horse, everybody puts the halter way up on the on the bone. Whereas you say, hey, let's get the halter down on the cartilage, you know, two, three fingers above the nostril. Now to a horse person, they're looking at that and they're saying, hey, get that, get that halter back up. You have said, no, you want it right there where it communicates. And I've even heard you say, this is all bone up here. This don't mean diddly to them. Can you talk to me a little bit about that discrepancy there that a horse person might have with moving the halter down a little bit lower when they're used to having it up higher? Does a, does a horse respond differently? Is there, would you want to move it down uh, to the same place on a horse? Does that make no difference because mules care more about their nose than they do anything else. Can you talk a little bit about that discrepancy, Steve? Sure, you bet. So with a hackamore, you have different weights of hackamores. So how big they are, how big around they are, I like to use a heavier one to start with. And then as they are really perfecting and doing really good, I'll use a light one. So I can have it as small as my finger around or as or, or a big round is like an inch and a quarter or so braided rawhide. So I start with something heavy so that it gets them to tip their head down, put their nose on the vertical. Now, with a hackamore, you're going to ride two fingers above the nostril. And that's one of the reasons I started going with two fingers above the nostril with my rope halters. I found that my communication was more crisp and clear with my halters because that's what I did with my hackamores. 
So I started adjusting the halters and boom, I found out that the mule and the donkey will really, really, really well do well if that halter is down low. And especially when it comes to making them uncomfortable with those two knots adjusted in here, it can really make a difference. So, uh, yes, and I can tell you, Dave, that with with my halters, I even adjust a halter on horses, adjust it down like that because it's on it's it's in a nice place to help them not have to be pushed around with a lot of heavy pressure. With the knots up here in the bone, uh, people really have to pull on them or make them to make them stay in place. Uh, where if that that rope is adjusted down, night and day difference, and it's no different than the beginning training on a hackamore. That's good. That's very very good. Next question I got. This one comes from Marty. Marty emailed this in. Asked the question: Is the donkey foundation good to use on mules? So we had the saddle. Uh, the uh, Donkey Saddle Foundation, Foundation Saddle Donkey, something I can't remember the name of it. Yeah. Is are the same techniques that you would apply to the donkey, do those carry over to the mule and vice versa? Oh yeah, pretty much. Pretty much everything you see me do in that video foundation uh, saddle donkey is pretty much some of the same things I would do with uh, foundation coat starting. Uh, you'll see some of the identical same things. The, uh, the, the foundation coat starting, you'll see five people in there that have never trained a mule and donkey before. And uh, you'll see five mules, five green riders, and you see every one of them's almost verbatim, uh, just with just a little bit different depending on what happened, but every one of them's pretty much all the same. So yeah, that makes it pretty good. We just had a sale on that video, didn't we? We did. Foundation we did. Donkey. A lot of folks yeah. got it. It was uh, we put yeah. the digital video online. A lot yep. of folks got it uh, at fifty percent off. So of course it's back up at regular price. Um, we've got another one. I'm not sure which one we're. Carlos, do you remember which one we're releasing next? Have we not decided yet? We've got another one that we're going to be releasing for another fifty percent off here, real short. So those digital oh. videos, we've got a whole new chunk of digital videos that we're going to be putting out there. So be going to muleranch.com. We will make sure to announce it and you can get, um, we rarely ever put anything on sale because, well, Steve, we try to keep everything as low as possible because we know that folks, they've got to spread their money a lot of places with these mules and donkeys. So we make the regular price as low as we can get it. But with these digital ones, we can go a little bit lower. And so we've got another one that we'll be putting out. So go to muleranch.com. Uh, make sure you check out. We're going to be making that here live, I think, in the next day or so. Um, and, uh, yeah, real happy to do that. Uh, let's see here. Yolanda has chimed in. So Yolanda's here. We missed her for a couple of weeks. Yolanda, it's good to have you back. We love yep. having you here. Uh, let's see here. She says, uh, <laughs> she goes, Steve, that is a huge cup you drink from. What cup you got, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> That's the one my, my, my brother and the Lord, Mark Williams, uh, made up for me. Uh, he, he made it up and I could put my iced tea in it and water and well, I mean, it keeps it pretty nice. And he had this cup especially made for me. I'm, I, I, I use it a lot and it keeps things nice and cold. Yeah. That's and, good. And around like here, that. you got to be hydrated. I was going to say in Arizona, nice and cold and hydrated. That is uh, that's the secret to success, especially yeah. in the summertime. I got my secret weapon in here. This is, uh, two oh, tablespoons of uh, maple syrup, uh, two, uh, one tablespoon of lemon, uh, pure lemon juice, uh, and eight ounces of water, and then a little bit of cayenne pepper. There we go. And boy, does that hydrate you. That's what keeps the motor running. Absolutely. That's right. Uh, Suze is watching. Suze says hi there. Suze, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, Yolanda, she is a sister in the Lord. She's sharing some of her favorite verses. I love that. Astra's watching. Uh, we're glad that you're here, Yolanda. Yolanda says, I feed my mule pure grains like black oat, yellow oat, green peas, black sunflower seed, corn, spe uh, spelled rye, uh, and small vitamin pellet and sea salt two times a week and dried herbs. I mix that and give that in a very small amount and all grains are whole. Not one is grinded because they need to use their teeth. And by doing that, they use all nutritional values for the full 100%. Sounds like she's got quite the regimen there, Steve. Yeah, she's done a good job 
of putting together her own little mixture yep. to help out, you know, and folks, that's what you can do. You can mix, grind this stuff up, mix it together, make up your own little ingredients. Uh, uh, and it really works good. I've, I used to, uh, do my own thing too. I would use, uh, like, uh, uh, oh, let's see here. I, I would use some olive oil. Uh, I would use some grains and put it together with some salt, uh, some different vitamins and minerals and make it up. But uh, I, I use olive oil and I'd also use, uh, what's that other granola oil and, and made up, you know, you know, different things for them. And it oils them up, gets the, all the sand and stuff out of their bellies. It works good. That's good. You know what I like about Yol Yolanda and a lot of the folks um, almost everyone. I mean, I, I actually can't think of one person who says, you know, doggone it, Steve, um, I'm just going to keep drilling my mule into the ground. I, I think everyone that we have in this community here, they really want the same thing Yolanda wants, and that is to do right by their animal. And one of the things that we hear over and over and over, so this is really a compliment to y'all watching, uh, but it's folks saying, I'm getting ready to have my first mule, or, or I've got a mule that's under my care, or I've always been, you know, thinking about getting a mule. I want to get one or, you know, I've had one for a little while now and I'm still learning. What they say is they want to do right by their animal. They're learning as much as they can. And what I love about that is that's really the best thing they can do because folks want to know what's the best thing I can do for my mule. And what you say over and over, Steve, is learn as much as you can. Just be a student. Learn as much as yep. you can. Uh, and what works for you, do what works for you. And I, I love that about this community that we've got here. Don't you agree? Yeah, absolutely. You know, if it works for you, use it, you know, uh, like all the things that I tell you that I do, if it don't work for you, don't use it. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, it's, um, there's a lot of people out there, some good trainers, good quality stuff that uh, there are, there are. So, you know, try it uh, and, you know, try it different times. Maybe you didn't have your hand quite tweaked right or something like that, but yeah. you, you can make it work. You Very know? good. Uh, Beth Fisher is watching from Pennsylvania. Beth, we're so glad you're hanging out with us for a little bit. Dan Davis is watching. Um, this, excuse me, this is one here. Jan Blake says liquid Benadryl for snake bites as well. You ever heard of that one, Steve? Yes, yes, yes. Matter of fact, uh, I'll go ahead and go a little bit more deeper with it. Yeah. Uh, one of my neighbors over here got bit by a rattler and she, uh, uh, her husband called me over and says, Hey Steve, uh, what do you think? He knows I'm a firefighter and, and knows we've gone through a, a lot of training, a lot of EMS training. And I says, you take your wife and you get to the hospital right now. You know, in the meantime, elevate the leg and, and use Benadryl. Absolutely. Uh, the liquid Benadryl is, is awesome. Uh, perfect. You can, uh, you can definitely put it in some feed if they'll do it. But most of the time when I use the liquid Benadryl with my mules, I reach in, get my tongue, pull the tongue out and then squirt it back there in the back. But the, the Benadryl would definitely work. And, and if you're doing, if you're doing, uh, running a line like I would, you can also, uh, use the Benadryl through the line and, and give it to them that way. Sub Q. Very good. Uh, Dan's watching from St. Augustine, Texas. He says, better late than never. Been working with my mules, Chester and Blackjack. Only been working with Chester three months and Blackjack one month. Uh, with the come along rope, my mules are great. Had my cousin's kids on them this past weekend and all went great. We're glad to hear that. Nothing better than, a, than a, a, a report of a lot of fun and uh, everyone's safe. Love hearing that. Uh, let's see here. Beth says, do you know a feed comparable to the lake and like you recommend for donkeys? Because we cannot get the lake and light up here in Pennsylvania. So would that be one of those deals where you take those ingredients and then go to the, go to the, um, the, the shop and say, Hey, what do you have most like this? Yeah, that'd be the best thing to do. Uh, and then again, folks, I can't tell you enough about getting a veterinarian to do a hair sample, a hair follicle, to kind of see what your your donkey or your mule is deficient in and then make sure they get it that way. Just don't throw a bunch of vitamins and minerals to them and go from there. The best way to do it really is to see what each individual needs. But yes, you can, you, you bet you take the ingredients, go into your feed store, say, hey, what do we have close to this? That's good. You know, and then, then monitor to for folks. When you change feed, I need you to look at several things. I need you to watch the color of their urine 
and that's really important. The lighter it is, the better. Uh, and, and and watch their their apple droppings there, their poop. And watch the color of it. See how it's changing and this sort of thing. How shiny it is. How much moisture it has in it. And then watch their water intake and this sort of thing. Is that feed is going to see? You'll see the end result will end up being in the urine and in the in the road apples. Very good. Uh, let's see here. John is watching. Uh, John, so glad that you're here. He says, "Hi, Stephen, Dave." Can the come along hitch be used with horses as well as with mules? Is it as effective with horses as it is with mules? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Who I learned from, John, was a guy by the name of Nick West up in Alberta, Candry, Canada, in the Sundry area. And Nick, he he mainly just trained on horses. That's what Nick did. Ranch cowboy all his life. And he used it on horses. And that's how I learned uh, to use it was uh, – was on my my horses and my mules uh, back before I went all to all nothing but mules. But uh, that come along hitch works beautiful. And let me tell you, if you got if any of you all have any F uh, uh, 4H uh, steers, use that come along hitch on that. Man, it does great. I've used it on camels. <laughs> I've used it on sheep. It works good. And I've even used it on wild cattle. It really works great. That's good. Uh, so Edie just threw in a question. Now we've got a video. It's about 11 minutes long where you answer this. So let's go for the short answer here. Uh, but Steve, Edie asks, is a 14 year old mule any harder uh, to start training than a young mule? No, not really. The nice thing about the young mule is that nobody's touched them. If that's nice, if you can get them to where nobody has put a halter on them and, and this sort of thing and taught them bad habits. <clears throat> the big problem with, with 14 year olds is you don't know how many people have handled them and everybody's kind of give them a little bit of a bad habit. Can you get through it? Yes. Can you train them? Absolutely. I don't, I don't train my 14 year olds any different than I do my four year olds. I've got my ground foundation work that I do starting with a come along hitch using the rope halter. I sur single them. I take my, uh, rope halter, which is adjusted, and I take baling twine and go back to my sur single, and they learn how to be halter trained. Uh, I take my sur single and I put on my mule rider's martingale and put that on there, and they learn how to be bit trained, all without having anybody on their back. So, yes, absolutely. Very good. Uh, we've got a couple more folks over here on YouTube. Uh, Leonard is watching, so Leonard, we're glad that you're here. Uh, David Walls from Kentucky is watching, and then Susan has a question. Uh, Susan says, what is the best way to teach your mule to trot in hand? I am using your rope halter, but when I get ahead of her, it bumps her nose, causing her to throw her head and try to back away from pressure. Okay, so we're talking about from the ground then. It sounds like you want to go into a trot. You're on the ground. The mule is trotting alongside of you. So I would first start with the come along rope. Uh, and use that to, to get her to go into a trot. Uh, it sounds awful tiring to me. I don't think I'd want to be trotting alongside of a mule, but uh, you, the best way I would do it personally is to have them be free. Put them in the uh, round pin and don't put a rope or halter or anything on, on them and get them to learn how to trot on your cue. Right. And they'll do it naturally, by the way. You get in the saddle, there's a, that's a different way. When you get in the saddle, you're going to do a lead departure, and, and that's a whole new training in itself. Very good. Uh, uh, Dawn just hopped on YouTube. She says, been a long while, Dawn. We're glad that you're here. Glad that you came back, hung out with us a little bit. It's good to see you. Uh, Edie says, thanks. She was talking about, okay, so Edie had the question about the 14-year-old. Is it harder to train? This one's a mini. She knows tricks, but I want her to drive. Thanks so much. Gives me hope. Love, love yep. hearing that. Love oh, good. Hearing that. You, you, that that's actually pretty priceless. Just gives me hope. Yep. Isn't that really what we're going after oh, here? Can absolutely. Give yeah. folks hope here. Yep. Uh, let's see. Yolanda, this will be our last question here. Yolanda had a question. Says, what about a five-year-old John mule that is only used for hauling dead animals when the hunters go on hunting and bring a five-year-old with them and smells this... <laughs> and smell these shot dead animals. <laughs> she got quite the sense of humor there, Yolanda. Appreciate yeah, she's that. She's quite character. I, uh, you know, like Stacy, the mule you rode, 
she hauled out a lot of animals, uh, you know, elk and deer and this sort of thing. She was good at it. You know, pretty much every mule that uh, I've ever owned has always hauled some type of dead game because I do a lot of hunting. Yeah. Hey, I just saw one that I missed, Steve. This one's from Donna. So, Donna, hope you didn't get scared there. I apologize if I frightened you a little bit that we didn't get to your question. Donna says, just picked up a mare and a mule baby. These are my first. He is seven weeks old. What is the most important thing I should do with him now? You should uh, use the come along rope on him. I, I call it come along string. Uh, you can take some baling twine to make a come along and just kind of lead him around a little bit, right and left, just a few minutes at a time and pick up all four feet. Uh, that's the other thing. And remember, folks, here's the thing with these colts. When you're, you are above them and you're rubbing on them, and with blankets and this sort of thing, it's the same thing as if you're up on top riding them. You're up on, you're up above them, and so they they see that. So pick up all four feet. Uh, do make sure if you can. It's not too late. It's not too late. Get Dr. Robert Miller's book on imprinting and do some imprinting on that colt now. You know, it's not. It's nice when you got them right away, right when they get born. When they're on their birth, but you can also imprint them uh, all the way up till they're about eight, nine months old. Very good. I'll try and find the link there to that book um, so I can put it out there for, for folks to find. Steve, that is everything for this week. How about it? We got through another week. By golly, we did it. I got to talk to Jason. I don't know if Jason's listening to me from California. He called me just before uh, <coughs> the show and left a message. And then he apologized afterwards. He said, dang, Steve, I didn't know it was your, I just realized it was your 51st anniversary and that you had the information on there. I hate to have you bother. Don't, don't want to bother you. And, um, but that's okay. I need to talk to him a little bit about some shoeing and trimming uh, because he had quite a few questions there. And folks, that shoeing and trimming is really important. Make sure you get that done Very good. every eight weeks. Very good. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for hanging out. Really grateful that you spent a little bit of time with us. You know, I want to let everybody know that uh, if you if you have not checked it out yet, we actually have put all of our past, or we are in the process of putting all of our past shows on a podcast. And so if you'd like to download all of the past shows as, as we re-release them as a podcast, I'm putting a link in the comment section right now where you can do that. And basically, it's it's exactly what you get right here. But it's all the ones that we've done in the past. You can download them to your device on uh, Apple Music, podcasts. Uh, you can download them on Spotify, Stitcher, wow. Google Music, Pandora. They're on all of them. So whatever you're listening from, go there. Look for the Mule Ranch podcast. I'm going to put a link. I'm dropping it right now in the comment section. Uh, a link you can go click and uh, from your mobile device or from your computer, just click the Click the player that you like using. You can subscribe, and as we release more and more and more, you'll get more and more and more. It's absolutely free, wow. and uh, it's a lot of good information. So, Steve, thanks for taking a few minutes. Uh, what do you and Susan have planned for this evening? Are you just going to take it easy, or are you going to go out somewhere? You know, we really haven't made any plans yet, Dave. We were going to go up to Big Lake and, uh, and spend about three days up there and take the kayaks and, and take Jess and go around. And Susan got to looking at me the other night, and she said, you know, uh, why do we really want to leave? And we got everything we need right here at the ranch, you know. Uh, we got that above-ground pool, and Jess has got his sheep, and, you know, we can do about anything we want to do right here. Uh, so we decided rather than, than driving four hours and blowing 100 bucks and fuel one way, we stay home, you know. Yeah. I, you know, that's, that's just what you can do after 51 years, so – we just been doing the normal thing. Susan's been doing the laundry and cleaning the house, and uh, I've been doing the shipping out and working with my pup. You know, so uh, there you go. Nothing more uh, relaxing than just kind of taking it easy. I'll tell you what, we celebrated. Yep. Me and Sandra, we celebrated our thirteenth. Um, so we're on our way. We're not quite there yet. We celebrated yep. our thirteenth on uh, June thirtieth, and yep. uh, with the kids, you know, you're kind of up to the mercy of uh, who can watch the kids and win. So. We yeah. actually had her mom volunteer to watch the kids, said, I'll watch them the weekend of the uh, of the 12th. So on Friday, me and my wife, we're going to go up to a resort here in Arizona, and we're going to spend a little bit of time 
uh, just hanging out. And we got a really good deal because it's over 110 degrees out here. So we got a really good deal. But we're going to go hang out, spend some time together. The, the kids yeah. will get in some time with the grandmother. So we've got a good weekend coming up here. So uh, yeah. we're on our way to 51, though. We'll be there in uh, we'll be there in about 30, what, 38 years. But we're on our way. Good for you. So you're going to do a little staycation down there in Scottsdale, huh? That's right. That's one of the benefits of being out here in Arizona is uh, is when the summertime rolls around, all these resorts that are just booming and it's too yeah. expensive to get into for uh, for us throughout the rest of the year oh, yeah. during the summer, they they got rooms they need to fill. So we hopped on the yeah. group on there and uh, Sondra found a really good deal. So we're, we're real excited. Good for Sondra. That's great. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, hey. Thank you, everyone, for spending your Wednesday afternoon, early evening with us. For those of you yep. on the East Coast, we're really grateful. We know you could be doing a lot with your time, and we're grateful that you're, uh, that you're spending it with us. So thank you. Be sure to share. Be sure to subscribe, especially if you're over on YouTube. And uh, how about it? We'll see you next week. Hey, eh, Steve? Yep. We'll see you all. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. See ya.